the goal of magic is to create an effect, a fascination that has no explanation, not possible explanation. And I'm stepping pretty much on the other side of that. Once we are blocked from understanding how things work, I think we leave people uh, blind. Leandro, the focus of the exhibition we're opening today are two large-scale immersive installations, Batimont and Cabinet du Sai, which you did roughly at the same time around 2004-2005. Among many other things, they embody a key aspects of your production, architectural space as well as the concern with psychoanalysis. I would like to start with architecture and architectural space. Why architecture? Were you trained as an architect? What is, what is your, why are you so concerned about capturing architectural spaces and the architectural dimension in your work? Um, it's a good question. I'm, I wasn't trained as an architect, um, but I did grow up in a family of architects. My, my father, my aunt, my brother, three of them, they were architects. And what I realized at some point, I realized that I understood architecture, not in the sense of the design and the functionality of the space, rather on what the space, I remember visiting construction sites, I remember having a sense of how the space frame our conducts, our, our behaviors, our relationships, our stories. So in a way, if we think life is a, is a theater play, architecture is the stage where everything happens. And the space conditions our, you know, our activities, our behaviors. We are directed uh, in, in our daily life through the space. It's a, it's a strong presence of humankind on the planet. We build not only houses, we build cities. The presence, the, 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 the physical presence of architecture is so strong that it's able to, to compete with the natural order. And I think that since our relationship with this uh, architecture, the big cities, we consider all this as part of reality and part of the real, we may forgot for a moment that all this is part of a human invention. Mm -hmm. But in other words, you're using architecture as a tool to set, uh, to set the stage you know, for people to interact. So you're providing the conditions, the physical conditions, you know, in the installation for people to establish connections between each other. Because, I mean, it looks, it seems that you see architecture as part of the environment and as part of a connectivity. You know, everything is connected in that sense. It is. Uh, yeah, totally. I think that this is, that will be, I, I think, a, an aspect of a interconnection between the audience as much as an experience, uh, like an, an inner experience of each individual in relation to the work, I would split that experience in two, one uh, or in three. I, I, I usually think that the audience inside the work plays a role of an actor. Simultaneously, plays the role of the interpreter. And at the same time, it plays the role of the audience looking at someone else. So, this, the, so there are these three actions simultaneously happen, happening. It's like uh, you, someone is looking at someone else, doing it, something. And at that time, the person is a witness. And, um, but 
immediately after or before that person was the person who was playing a role. And whatever the role is, is it, it presents itself as something very spontaneous. There's no direction for, and I always thought it was important for anything that would be interactive, not to have a, you know, a guide, uh, as a written paper or a direct, providing a direction, rather to have the space direct uh, the experience. No, because the space presents itself as an everyday space. So people don't, can't make the distinction initially between you know, an everyday space or the fact that this is a work of art or it operates in the realm of art. So it's easier to access that, that experience you know, without any kind of mediation. Now, I think one of the aspects that is critical in both of these installations, both Batimon and the, the um, Cabinet du Sai, is the fact that they both use mirrors to transport viewers from one space into another. So it's not just the experience of being in the space, but it's the experience of being in the space and looking at yourself you know, in a mirror, performing some kind of action in relation to the piece. And it seems that mirrors are present basically in all of your work or, or most of your work. So I would ask you, why mirrors? You know, what is it that you want to pursue with the mirror? From, from a physical point of view, I think is uh, they are, they produce a source of magic, a source of uh, the reconstruction of a, a virtual existence of something else. Any reflection proves uh, the presence of something displaced from whatever is reflected. So already, uh, and that's so uh, simple, uh, the, the, the way that the mirror, a uh, reflective surface functions, yet remains over time equally fascinating. And, and in each case, for example, in the Cabinet de Psy or in the Batimon, I think that the use of the reflection points towards a different direction and it brings a different symbolic experience. So are you, are, is your intention to, uh, are you playing uh, with the physical optical effect? Is that what you're concerned with? You know, how that operates and how the viewer relates to that at a, at in, in the physical way? Or are you trying to stimulate some kind of psychological reaction on the part of the viewer? Well, it's a very good question. I will start by saying that my interest on perception is not something that relates to, um, how to say, by the optical or the optical illusion. That I, I couldn't, I, I, I don't care about that aspect yet exist. What I do care is that I believe that perception is the inherent tool we all born with and are the five senses that allowed us to get access to knowledge. This is the beginning before we even go to school, before even we learn the language to communicate with others. We see, we touch, we smell. Let's think about, for example, uh, Copernicus. You know, uh, everybody saw before him that a, the whole universe was spinning around the earth. You now you see the sun, the moon, the planets. Why would you would think any different? The, your eyes are proving, I mean, you're testing, and that's the beginning of science. And the understanding of reality, which for me is a way to awake awareness and to develop a critical sense is, is primary, that's the, why, the reason why mirrors. And that's why the reason why I'm interested in inviting through uh, uh, an experience that is also playful because no one is uh, forced to, to participate. 
on the contrary, I think that is, is the, the work is, is very inviting and very seductive. seductive. What about Narcissus? And what about identity? I mean, because mm -hmm. I mean, Tot totally. You know, you're, you're engaging the viewer with his own image. Ex well, exactly, it's exactly that. And 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 when I did uh, well, Narcissus, and from the psychoanalysis point of view, uh, there is something that is called the state of Narcissus, which is the moment in which a child realizes that his or her reflection on the mirror is him or herself, because before they think it's another boy or someone else. Uh, that is also part of the cognitive process of, of, uh, of uh, and, and part of the process of learning. And when I realized, um, well, the, 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 the living room at the Glacelle School as part of the core program, the absence of the mirror for me was clearly about what you just mentioned, how to not see your own reflection. It's not because you become Dracula. It's, it's, it's a strong physical experience that to me led me to think about identity, about your existence. If you see things, or the other way around, if things exist because you see them, once, once you don't see yourself, do we exist? Right. Hmm. So to me, uh, all this is the, the, the part of the universe of things I am interested about. I am not proving, neither attempting to prove any uh, law or theory. It's, it's a, it's a, yeah. You're providing the conditions for the viewer to find him or herself, you know, in, in their image, you know, in some way or another, and to, to activate, you know, their awareness of their surroundings and of themselves, you know, through the installation. Um, your work somehow, for all of these reasons, you know, it, it alters our perceptions of reality. And some people have talked about your work as involving magic. Um, do you see yourself as a trickster or, or a magician, you know, trying to um, play with, with that notion of, of, of magic and influencing, you know, people through that? Or is that too superficial uh, uh, to, for what you're trying to do? Um, I would say that the goal of magic is to create an effect, a fascination that has no explanation, not possible explanation. And I've, I'm stepping pretty much on the other side of that because all the work, actually, wherever there is a trick, is completely open. So, and I, I do believe that to share this with a, as part of the experience is like a, a way to, the, it, it articulates the process of understanding. Once we are blocked from understanding how things work, I think we leave uh, people uh, blind. And, and, and that goes from the museum, from the art center to, society. I mean, we need to understand. And something I felt in relation to cinema, in relation to magic, is that once you see something, I don't know, you see a cow flying in the film, you know, if, I guess if someone saw this back in the time of, of, uh, of the Lumière, the brothers who created cinema, people will be like, oh, how this happened like now we can watch all kind of visual effects and you don't question anything because you know that everything is possible in the you don't know how it works really the the that kind of the, the, the technology how is it made but 
you don't question it. It's not not part. On the contrary, I think that to to let the audience to participate and understand uh, how things happen uh, is uh, is uh, yeah is is so that they they realize part of the social construct that they're they're in. Exactly. You can we could parallel what happened inside of this fake space, which looks like a room that you know, but it doesn't, you know, it, the only reason why it looks like is it's a matter of association is because we associate something that looks familiar. That's not a facade of a building. I mean, the only reason why you th we think it's a facade, the only reason we think that facade, we, 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 we understand the story is because it relates to the familiar. And then we can, uh, yeah, we can get the threat, uh, and and and. But it's part of the of the, the the viewer at one point, like she was pointing out, gains awareness, you right. know, that this is a fake, that this is a construction. But at the same time, he's being, his perception is being altered in some way. So it's all part of that moment of detachment, you know, which is what happens in film, is what happens in, in Bertolt Brecht. Uh, there's that moment of, of detachment, you know, from, from what's happening to gain a, a much larger awareness of your surroundings. Absolutely. And I wonder if that awareness that happens within uh, an art exhibition can be taken outside the doors of the art center because the real building that is hosting this exhibition is as real as the installation itself or as fake or as artificial this is is being built as this amphitheater this this um uh, we are having the conversation here because this is a place where people potentially make a conversation and have a, a talk. Um, it's part of a set. And what I find fascinating about um, uh, this work and the way that you have uh, cited it in, in different places is that it involves the viewer, as we said, as an active participant, but with other anonymous I mean, other viewers that he or she doesn't don't know. I mean, so in a way, it's like creating a sense of community, uh, and it's and it's linking people, connecting them, you know, one with another, um, in a in a very enjoyable, very playful experience in which they are not only discovering things about themselves but also about the people around them. Is this uh, a deliberate uh, intention on your part? Uh, I don't know if I don't know. If it's Are you trying to create a sense of community through these? Words? I am. I think it, I, I will respond this the more honest I can. I do because I think that expressed my character, the way I relate to or, or my beliefs. It's not a plan of uh, creating like now as. When, when something is in a way, what I think is, is we, pl we do art with a certain parameter of, of planification, but we cannot have a full sense and comprehension of the effect the work will create. Now, looking, not now, years ago already, I realized about the aspect of how the work is inviting people to to interact, to meet. And when you see people in these platforms that are even touching, because they, when they hang on the building, say, do you mind I hang from your ankle to, to you know? <laughs> it's like people are completely strangers are interacting. Or when people are in the psychoanalyst office in the cabinet of the Psy, it's like, they see the ghost and they are starting talking and sharing what they are seeing and experiencing with someone else who's in the room and you start a conversation. 
And I think that that's, uh, that's awesome. I think this is, it gives me a sense of, yeah. And that, that is the psychological situation of play, right? That, that there is an, a return to your childhood, a return to almost this innocence, right? Um, that, that you're pulling into, that play becomes very important in these works. Yeah, uh, remember Rachel that play, that you know, we forgot sometimes that play is the learning process of childhood. Absolutely. It's not, it's not, it's not because nowadays I think that when we think about playing, we think about entertainment. We think about something that we we do as a spare time. We do not associate the playing with learning. And I'm interested in on learning. Um, and in, in thinking about, you know, these these psychological aspects, I'd, I'd like to turn to Cabinet du Cid, um, which concerns architecture, but also a key component of your work, which is uh, psychoanalysis. And we've talked a little bit about psychological aspects of play. Um, and and this work, the uh, let me turn to the work. This work, as well as others, uh, really visualize a number of psychoanalytic concepts. And you touched upon one, the mirror stage, Lacan's mirror stage, where we construct our own identity by viewing our own image as well as seeing the image of others. Um, but there's also this Freudian idea of transference, where we project our unconscious out into the world. Um, were these concepts or other psychoanalytic concepts influential to the creation of Cabinet du Cid? Uh, and are you trying to make the viewer aware of these unconscious processes? Um, I wasn't aware of the, the concepts of the psychoanalysis concepts of, I, I mean, I did a transfer, yes. I mean, there were some of them I was aware, some of them not. It, actually, the beginning of this, I was living in Paris uh, back in 2004, 2005, and I felt it, Paris also shares, well, it's also uh, very close, uh, psychoanalysis is very strong, and as Bu uh, Buenos Aires as well. And, and to me, it makes me think that uh, within a world where there is no much, uh, let's say, I found that psychoanalysis w remain as a validated practice in the um, in the logical world to reflect upon our existence, something that in the in the rational world the rational world most most of the time is not able to take everything that becomes like the spirit the spiritual as a matter of having an inner sense of you know considering and questioning yourself and your existence but one practice that we do validate in the in, in in the Western world, is that we, which is close to science, is to try to understand that everything that your emotions, your your self, you, yourself, have a, a, an explanation for everything. So in a way, it's like it it it, it takes the room. Um, I mean, my father was an architect, and my mother a geologist. Okay. So. In a way, I, I grew up in a family where uh, both of them were, you know, doctors. Uh, my mother was a doctor. It's, a, a, it's appropriate a, 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 in the psychoanalytic concept to talk about your parents yes, now. Yes, very, <laughs> very rational, very <laughs> rational. So I think this is a, that's what. But this, this, you mentioned the the Freudian um, uh, idea of of transfer. Uh, but also uh, someone point out, and I didn't know, uh, that Lacan was doing uh, some uh, optical um, prototypes mm -hmm. to explain some of the concepts. And one of them 
it was the idea of the of desire. There is a flower. He created a um, he created a kind of an art artifact mm -hmm. where there is a kind of an hologram, let's say, of a flower. Oh. So this is was to explain the idea of desire in the sense that what we desire, the desire the desire is not on that that you desire. The desire is not on that flower in the object. The desire is inside of you. So when you desire something, you, it's a projection of, of is inside of you. So right. to so in that in that uh, experiment, let's say he did, was a way to prove like once you try to reach that flower, and you cannot grasp, then you you're facing the discontent and the deception of not being able to grasp what you desire, but that has nothing to do with the flower. It's here. Yeah. Um, and do you feel that in the psychoanalyst office that we have these momentary glimpses, these kind of phantasmagoric glimpses of our own inner self, of our own desires? Um, First of all, to me, I, I think each, uh, to me already to see in the same way that we were talking before, not to see ourselves in a mirror, to see yourself, but in a ghost reflection, meaning uh, it, it plays in a very particular space where we usually go to, to, to reflect upon our issues. Uh, it's already uh, opens the. It, it's a it's a good start for the story. How the the lineup of the story, how it goes, it relates to each, uh, you know, each person who experienced the world. We should look at the yes. next image because yes, um, it is very what I found um, sitting there last uh, Wednesday. Hold on, uh, just it, for a second. Is that it is um, very destabilizing to see yourself as this ghost-like image, you know, inside uh, the office. There's something that confronts you, you know. I mean, all of a sudden you're looking at your image in this ghost-like manner, in this office space of a psychoanalyst. So something operates, you know, at the level of your un unconscious when you're going through this experience. I agree. And, and one of the things that I'm fascinated about art not not my practice only, but just the, in general, and I'm sure that you will share this, is that art, and uh, unlike science, that uh, fix parameters that once they become a law, they are fixed and solid parameters. Art continues to evolve, have its its own evolution from the big, from the moment the work is created to the moment the art is interpreted. Because when once we see this work as well, and we are transpolate to another space, isn't it that what is happening now, we do that all the time with our smartphones? Isn't it that uh, we want Skype? I mean, we are, we are, that's not so rare nowadays to be able to be somewhere else. Two places at once. Yes. One of, the, one of the things that really it struck me uh, when I experienced uh, the other night with the members of the preview dinner who, who came to the, um, who were all convened inside the psychoanalyst office, there's one aspect which we just talked about, about how you see yourself as this ghost-like image and what that kind of, all kinds of reactions that that triggers in your unconscious. But then there's another aspect that I wasn't so aware of, even though I had seen the images of this work, which is the fact that you turn into some kind of tableau, you know, with the other people. When you look at this image, it's almost like you're looking at a group portrait, you know, from the Renaissance or, you know, the Baroque period. It, it creates a, a different image of a work of art. I, I mean, it's a very, very strange uh, right. 
very strange feeling. I mean, have you have you ever thought about it in those terms? No, but now that you say it's true, it's true. I think, um, yeah, the 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 interaction with the work and the what each of us bring into the experience of the work is what makes it opens thoughts like the ones you just express and that thought is part of your um art the archive of <laughs> yourself <laughs> you know, it's like below. their history archive. <laughs> yes, your the way you see the world, the way the things that you the, the, the keep you hook uh, in the path of your life, and then you relate to things and you make associations that you know. And and when you say it, I could say exactly, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then someone else will come uh, who I don't know has another. Um, a psychoanalyst or you know an architect and each person will input an interpretation and that is extremely valuable because that's what it's about to really open the game and to interact with others in a way that we create a, syner a, a synergia but it makes it very open uh, uh, accessible to to anyone coming in, um, and and I'm curious. We have a, a number of other works in the exhibition, the elevator and neighbors, which you actually created while you were here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in the core program. Um, and I'm wondering how you continued uh, this idea of what you started with La Boca, la, la, El Obelisco de La Boca, uh, how you translated that here in the in the core program with the development of elevator and neighbors and some of your other works like the swimming pool um, well uh, actually the elevator was a, actually the it's a funny story because just before coming to the core program happened to I, I had a, I, I made an exhibition at the Argentinian consulate in New York uh, and that's where these pi the pieces were produced originally in, in Buenos Aires, the, uh, both the ascensor, the elevator, and neighbors. And the elevator is the first object I made right after and simultaneously of the Proyecto de la Boca. So, so the first object I create after the, the, the Obelisco en la Boca is the uh, this elevator and then the second is neighbors um, what what I did create in Houston for the first time is the living room that I built in the in the studio uh, itself because uh, I it took a lot of time for preparation and so basically I used my own studios as as an exhibition space and the swimming pool the following year. And to me, the Houston experience, uh, the core program allowed me to expand. It, it was the first time that I was thinking on creating something that I do remember the idea I had at that time, that it was a work of art which we would not be able to see the outline. The outline. Yes, the outline. The outline. Mm -hmm. oh. So any work of art in general, a sculpture, a painting, you have the, you know, there is an outline of the work. So this work, you are inside of the work oh, of the, yeah, you are inside and there is no way you will be able to perceive in the living room the whole thing as an object and that's stepping into what is the installation work let's say uh, but and that's what today is a word that we hear so often 
which is this idea of immersive. Uh -huh. But uh, what I do consider interesting about the immersive is to be aware that we are immersed, mm -hmm. not only inside the installation, we are immersed, always immersed on the role we play in the society. There is a big a structure. So basically it's like a... It's a microcosm yeah. of what's going on on the, on the outside. Um, and, and you also, we've spoken a lot about mirrors, but you also use technology um, like LED screens and videos to create these perceptual traps. Uh, for for visitors, and we see this exhibited in Night Flight, which is also in the exhibition. Uh, and I'm curious as to how this line of inquiry relates to your use of mirrors, which we discussed earlier. Um, well, at the very beginning, I was uh, skeptical or, or re resistant to the use of technology or what we call high tech because I felt like any high-tech element would prov it will bring the work into the hermetic that we were talking before. The, let's say the wow thing without understanding, without being able to trace how things are made. How, what, that's part of the, the beginning of one of the experiences. And night flight is a part of the... Um, a, a part, night flight is part of, I don't, you know, the, b before night flight, there was the, another piece that is, is, is more normal because it's white, uh, uh, the, the frame is white and what we see is the blue sky and it's called El Avión, the, the airplane, and so it's, it's is a day, let's say it's a daytime journey ver versus this one, which is nighttime. But when I place them one time together, I, I, I like also, I thought about the, uh, the constructivism uh, paintings of the black and white, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like a, yeah. a, with a new uh, approach into something that is part of my ordinary because I, I, I have been, or at, at least when I was creating this work, uh, I spent a lot of time on airplanes. So I, I think that the, the source of, of the, what is happening with my work and what is, what is the next and what is I'm producing, it, it relates very much to, to, to my own life. We talked about accessibility and we talked about um, also the fact that your art kind of breaks down this barrier between art and life. And so you confront people with things and experiences that are part of their daily lives, like the facade of a building or the elevator or a swimming pool. Um, these are e everyday experiences and you're very much interested in that. Um, and so I think that that's in many ways the power and the force of your work. But at the same time, it could be a limitation in the sense that, you know, the viewer doesn't perceive where the, dis where the barrier, you know, between art and life is anymore and uh, may not give it as much importance, you know, to the work. They see it as something that's part of their, of their environment. Um, is there a danger that, uh, you know, the, ex the experience itself that you're offering to them maybe take it for granted? We would prefer that the work will have an impact deeper and a little bit more reflective than the amusement or of the experience. But I do believe that somewhere, like it happened to me watching the films that I enjoy very much, I was in, in pure pleasure and enjoyment. Something may remain somewhere and what the pro work proposes, we see things that create an impact and maybe uh, when I was 10 years old, I, I visit 
uh, it was the first time my parents took me in a flight. We, we went to Europe, and when I saw art that create an impact on me without me knowing who these artists were, something gets implanted in a way that you see things that you're interested about. Maybe someone is interested to become a, a shrink <laughs> or an artist. <laughs> who knows? As long as, as, as long as, a, going back to your question about what would I, what I would like people take out of the exhibition, I would like people to feel inspired, empowered, and aware. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.